A few weeks ago, I showed you how to make a debloated ISO for Windows 11 using Tiny11 Builder. However, it wasn't customizable and in fact had a lot of restrictions that you guys had issues with. So today, I'm going to show you how to make a custom Windows 10 or 11 ISO that you can configure to be as bloated or debloated as you want. In fact, it's amazing the amount of customization that you can do with what I'm showing you today. Stay tuned. Okay, Windows 11 is bloated. We can all agree on that. But what we can't agree on is what constitutes a debloated copy of Windows 11. I mean, seriously, some people want to strip everything they can possibly strip out while still allowing Windows 11 to run. And some people actually like some of Microsoft's bloat. So today, we're going to make a custom Windows 11 ISO using a program called NT Lite. In fact, I made this exact same video about a year ago with Windows 10 using the MSDN Toolkit. Now the MSDN Toolkit worked pretty well, but there was a lot of sacrifices. Unfortunately, one of those sacrifices happened to be the creator losing hosting shortly after I made the video. Since then, I don't even know what the status of MSDN Toolkit is. So today, we're going to be doing this in NT Lite, which is a retail program, but they do have a free version, and that's the version that we're going to be using in this video. And also, one of the biggest requests that I had from the video on Windows 10 was to have the ability to install third-party apps as part of the Windows installation. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible in MSDN. SDN Toolkit, but it is possible in NT Lite, and I'm going to show you how to do it. But first, we got to pay some bills. Check out today's sponsor. Is your copy of Windows 10 unactivated? Well, it doesn't have to be, because with today's sponsor, VIP SCD Key, you can get a valid Windows 10 license for under $20. Stop dealing with that stupid watermark on the desktop The a valid license for Windows 10. Also, with an activated copy of Windows 10, you can upgrade to Windows 11 for free. Just go to the link in the description below and pick up a valid Windows 10 license key. During checkout, use the code CYBERCPU for a 25% discount. Once you have your key, go to your activation settings in Windows 10 and click on the link that says Change Product Key. Enter the product key you just purchased and hit Activate. Now you don't have to deal with that stupid watermark that come with running an unactivated copy of Windows 10. Now, on with the video. So make sure you watch this video all the way to the end because there's going to be a lot of information. So let's get to it. Okay, so here we are in Windows 10. This is going to be the system that we're going to be using to create the ISO in the first place. And also keep in mind, the guide that I'm showing you today will work on both Windows 10 and 11. This isn't just a Windows 11 tutorial. This is also perfectly applicable to Windows 10 as well, but we're going to be doing it on Windows 11 because it's the newest thing. So the first thing that we need to do is download a program called NT Lite. And I've got their website open right here, and I'll go ahead and leave a link in the description below for this. But all you have to do is go over to download, and then from download, go ahead and download the 64-bit version right here. And then once it downloads, it might take a couple seconds, but once it downloads, we're going to go ahead and show it in folder right here. We can go ahead and minimize our browser now. And then go ahead and run the program. And there's a couple different ways that you can install this. I'm going to install this as a portable app, but you can install this on your system as well, especially if you plan on using it a lot. So we're going to go through the setup process here. And right now it wants to install in program files, but that's not where I'm going to put it. I'm actually going to put it right on my desktop. So we're going to go right here. I'm going to throw it on my desktop here. And then if you do decide to install it portably, I would put it on your desktop or somewhere else where it's easy to find. Because otherwise, it will literally install the portable version in program files. So we're going to click Next, and I want to do Portable Mode. And then we can uncheck Create Desktop Shortcut. So then we're going to go ahead and hit Next, and it goes, goes ahead and does its thing. We uncheck Launch NT Lite Now and hit Finish. And then from here, there's one more thing that we're going to need. And that's going to be a Windows ISO that we can use to actually create a light version of Windows. So from there, we're going to go over to the Windows download page where you can actually download the media creation tool. However, a lot of people have criticized me for downloading the media creation tool when you can just grab the ISO right here. So today I'm going to do that. We're going to select download. We want Windows 11. And we're going to go ahead and hit download. And then the next step is, is you have to actually tell it what language you're speaking. So I'm going to hit United States, hit confirm. And then the next step is we're going to click right here to download the 64-bit version. And it'll start downloading it right there. Now, I've already downloaded this. So I'm actually just going to cancel the download real quick because, as you can see, 
I have it right here. So from there, the next thing we need to do is actually run NT Lite and start debloating Windows. So we're going to minimize this. We're going to open our NT Lite folder and we're going to click on NT Lite right here and then go ahead and hit yes. And then from this point, you open up to this screen. This is the license screen. Now there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can either buy a licensed copy or you can just use the free copy right here. Now I'm gonna use the free copy for this video, but this is a really killer program. You might wanna consider helping to support the development of this program by paying for the license. However, I haven't seen many restrictions on just using the free version. So if you don't have a lot of cash and you still wanna follow this guide, we're gonna be doing it with the free version. So simply select free and hit OK. And here's what you're left with. This is the program right here. Now the first thing that we want to do is add the ISO that we just downloaded. So from there, go ahead and click add. And then I'm going to select image ISO WIM ESD right here. And then we're going to go into our downloads folder and we're going to select the ISO right here and click open. And then here's our ISO right here. And then the next thing that you want to do is you want to right click on this ISO and hit new edit. Here it essentially copies everything from that ISO image to a cache directory that you can use to make a debloated copy of Windows. We're just gonna go ahead and hit okay. And it's gonna take a second to create this cache directory. So I'm gonna skip ahead to that. Okay, so now, you, now that we've got our cache ready right here, what we wanna do is we wanna select what edition of Windows we're going to be creating. Now I'm gonna use the pro version, but if you wanna use the home version or education or you pick whatever you want, I'm gonna pick pro right here and we're gonna right click and we wanna hit load. And what this is gonna do is actually load this ESD file, or in this case, it's gonna be a WIM file in order to edit it. So if your ISO has a WIM file, which is actually kind of rare, then this should go by fairly quickly. However, if your ISO has an ESD file, then it has to uncompress that ESD file in order for you to be able to edit it. And it's gonna take a little bit more time. And it's also gonna ask you if you wanna decompress all the different versions of Windows. And if you do, that's okay, but it's gonna take a really long time. So if you want it to be faster, go ahead and say no that you just want it to decompress the one specific image that you want to edit. So let's get back to it. Okay, so now once it loads the image up, you'll see right here, there's a little green light for the edition that we selected and it says loaded. And you'll see that you have a lot of selections on the side right here. And this is where we're going to actually customize our ISO for Windows. So the first thing we're gonna go, we're just gonna go through the list. And this isn't gonna be a really detailed guide. I'm just gonna kind of briefly go through what all of these settings do and kind of try to give you an idea of what you can do with this program. So the first one we're gonna go into is updates. And for updates, this is actually a really helpful part of making an ISO. What you can do is you can integrate all the latest updates into the ISO that you're currently making. Now, if you click on add, what you can do is you can go to latest updates online or latest online updates, and this will find all the updates that currently are not part of this ISO, but could be. So what you would do is you just go down the list and you can check all of these, and it will actually uncheck ones that are installed in other ways. Like for instance, if you look at this one, this KB5022497, this is for the .NET framework. Well, we also have KB5025182, which is an older KB for the .NET framework. Well, if I check this, it automatically unchecks that. So I would just click on the one with the latest date on it. If you can see right here, the build date, this one's 22 and this one's 23. So we'll go ahead and leave the latest one on there. This is one of the downsides of the free version. If I click download right here, it'll say that's only a premium feature, but that's okay. It's just essentially a time saver. If you hit in queue, it's still gonna download all the updates. It's just gonna do it as part of the ISO building. So we're gonna go ahead and hit in queue right there. And then we're gonna move on to the next step, which is drivers. And then I'm not gonna add any drivers to this, but if for whatever reason you want to add a driver into your Windows install, then you can from this point right here. In fact, if you look right here, all of these different, this is essentially your device manager for the system you're currently using. So if you wanted to, say for instance you have a display driver, you could take this display driver and add it here and then that way you don't have to download and install it when you install Windows from the ISO that you're using. Or you can also download different drivers from different manufacturers websites and have those included as well. I'm not gonna add anything now, but you can add as many drivers as you want in your ISO. Okay, so the next step that we're gonna go to is right here where it says registry. Now this one here, I haven't had a lot of time to play with the registry in this one, but essentially what you would be doing is you would just be adding 
registry files. These are regular .reg files. And if you make any modifications to your registry at all, you can import those registry files into your new ISO by simply adding them right here. Now, this is actually a really powerful part of this program because this will allow you to import registry files or registry modifications that you made on your system into an ISO so it does them automatically when you install Windows. Now, I can find a lot of reasons why this right here would come in really handy. Okay, so moving right along, we're gonna go into components. And in components, this is where you actually start debloating Windows. It does give you a warning that you need to be really careful about which components you remove from Windows. Because this, if you remove the wrong thing, you could actually make Windows not work anymore. And that wouldn't be good having an ISO that doesn't function. But we'll move, we'll look at that a little bit later. I'm gonna show you some of the things that are kind of safe to edit. So we're gonna go ahead and hit OK and we're gonna go through this list right here. So the first thing you want to do is look at Windows apps right here. And this will give all the different apps and stuff like that that are associated with Windows. And if you go on here, if you go into just regular apps, these are just your regular program apps, you can kind of go through and you can decide which ones of these you don't want, like ClipChamp. No, I don't want it. Coro Cortana, no, I don't want it. Feedback, and you can essentially go through and you can uncheck a lot of these ones that you just don't want installed on your system. You can go on next, as you scroll down here, you can see system apps. And if you click on system apps and then scroll down here, there's essentially a lot of the same stuff. There's just different things that are more considered system programs. Like you've got File Explorer. Please don't remove that one. It could cause you a lot of problems. However, there is one that you definitely do want to get rid of. And that's right here. It's the Content Delivery Manager. Now, the Content Delivery Manager is kind of a double-edged sword. So keep this one in mind, but this is one that you might want to get rid of. What this does is get rid of all of the ghost apps that come with Windows 11. You know the ones I'm talking about, like... Twitter and TikTok and the, the apps that aren't actually installed, but they give you shortcuts that if you click on the shortcut, it'll go ahead and install the app. This gets rid of all of those. However, at the same time, it also gets rid of your custom wallpapers on your login screen. So you don't get the different wallpapers every couple of days that you would normally be used to getting. However, I think that's a pretty good trade-off. Don't you? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Let's move on. So essentially, you can kind of go through here and just remove the stuff that you don't want. It's a pretty straightforward process. And this is kind of the way it goes when you're debloating Windows. So go through here, pick the stuff that you want. Another Xbox, we're gonna uncheck that one. But we're gonna go through and pick the stuff that you wanna remove and just uncheck it and it won't install it into the ISO. So moving on to the next one, we're gonna go into scheduled tasks. Now scheduled tasks, I'm not gonna do a lot of changes in here. However, if there's any scheduled tasks that you don't want to be enabled by default, or you just wanna simply delete them completely, you can do it right here. These are essentially all the default scheduled tasks that come with Windows 11. So moving on to the next one, we're gonna look at features. Now this one right here is kinda similar to apps, but not really. If you, if you look at what is available in this list, you'll see what I mean. You've got like Hyper-V, if you'd like to have Hyper-V installed or not installed, you can decide it right here. You've got legacy components, so you can install direct play if you want to. There's a lot of different things you can do. One of the things that I like to install, and this one, some people might disagree with me on this one, but that's okay, is SMB 1.0. And the reason why is because if you have a lot of clients that use older style, corporate style printers that have scanners built into them, a lot of those old scanners don't support the newest versions of SMB. So you have to have SMB 1.0 set up if you want the scanner to work. So that's one that I typically check. But you can kind of scroll through this list and you can get the idea of what stuff this comes with. You can actually completely disable Windows Search right from here if you'd like to also. So go ahead and go through this list, decide what you want to get rid of and what you want to keep, and move on to the next step. So the next step here is gonna be settings. And from settings, this one's one that we're gonna spend a little bit more time in because this actually allows you to change the way that Windows itself is configured. So the first one that I'm gonna to go to right here is going to be the desktop right here. So we click on desktop and you can go through and there's lots of different settings that you can change right here, like accent color. This is the accent color like for the top bars right here. And if you click over here, you can select this little arrow on the bottom. You can select your color. So I'm gonna select like 
like, let's do navy blue. And then for the login UI accent color, we're gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna go the same color. We're gonna go navy blue. And then for the inactive title bars, you can change this one as well. And we're gonna do this one, let's do deep sky blue, that'll work. All right, and as you go through this list, you'll see all the different things that you can actually change. Like you can allow pinning store apps to taskbar the alt tab style. If you want, you can actually go to the classic alt tab style, or you can stick with the default if you want. The animation effects, you can decide to either enable or disable animation effects. The classic context menu, this is a good one. This is this context menu right here. Obviously Windows 10 has the classic one on it, but Windows 10 has the one that pretty much everyone loves to hate. And if you'd like, you can just Enable it in the ISO so you don't ever have to deal with the Windows 11 context menu. That setting right there might be the biggest benefit of this entire program. I'm serious. I hate the Windows 11 context menu. I hate it, hate it, hate it. And then right here, you can change dark mode for apps or dark mode for windows. Now, the way I typically use mine is I usually disable dark mode for apps, but I enable dark mode for Windows itself. As you can see, I've got my dark start menu and dark taskbar, but my apps are light. You can also decide which icons you want on your desktop or even your desktop icon size. As you can see, there's tons of different settings in here that you can change that will be default in Windows once you install the ISO. You can even change the mouse menu delay. You can change the notification center. You can decide to either enable or disable completely the notification center. That's one that I think a lot of people would like. You can also even take the search bar in the taskbar and just have that one disabled by default so you don't have to turn it off when you install Windows. There's tons of different things that you can do in here. You can even change the start layout. As you can see, Windows 11, you can either have more pins or more recommendations. I typically like more pins, so just set it right now. You can also change the taskbar alignment. So if you want the taskbar to be on the left, click here and you can have it on the left. Now this one right here, the taskbar classic, I don't recommend changing this one. I did and it didn't go over that well, so I wouldn't change that one, but you can change the chat bar and disable that one. You can also change the widgets bar and you can disable that one as well. And you can even have it not install Teams because yeah, who uses Teams? I don't even know. And this is another neat setting right here that you can use. You use the print screen button to open up your screen snipping. Now this one right here is a setting I would highly recommend changing. This is very helpful right here. So the next one that I'm gonna go through is we're gonna go through privacy. So if you come down here and go through privacy, there's a lot of things in privacy that I actually wanna change on this one. So let me show you how to do it. Now, some of these changes right here, like for instance, automatic installation of sponsored apps. So if you scroll down, the so if you scroll right here, you go automatic installation of sponsored apps right here. It's the consumer experience. We can disable that one. And then automatically install suggested apps. So if we click over here, we can also disable that one. And then occasionally show suggestions in start. So if we scroll down again, we can go to right here, occasionally show suggestions in start. We can disable that one as well. And then pre-installed apps. And then the pre-installed apps, if we go here, we can hit disable for that one. And then pre-installed OEM apps, which is right underneath it, we can go ahead and disable this one as well. And then show me suggested content in the settings app. So if you go down here, go to show me suggested content in settings app, and you can disable that one as well. And those are the ones that I would recommend disabling, but you know what, you can go through here and there's tons and tons and tons of different privacy settings that you can change from within this menu right here. And all of these things, just look at this. Look at all of these different privacy settings that you can change in here. It's amazing the amount of stuff that you can do on here. So we're gonna go ahead and minimize privacy again, and we're gonna go into start menu. And we're gonna see what we can change inside of here. As you can see, there's tons of different things that you can change from within the start button too. You can change the start button itself. You can actually enable or disable different features. Like for instance, let's say you don't ever want anyone to shut down. Well, you can disable the shutdown and you can only have restart. However, I don't know why you would want to do that, but maybe you do. Who knows? You can do whatever you want to do on your ISO to Windows. But as you go through here, there's 
different folders and stuff. And these folders right here, if you look at the bottom of the start menu, unfortunately I don't have Windows 11 installed, but I'll show you once we get it installed. But in the Windows 11, you'll have different folders down in the bottom corner right here. In Windows 10, we have them on the side, but in Windows 11, they're down in the bottom right-hand corner. Well, if you'd like, you can actually enable some of these from the very beginning. So on mine, I'm gonna enable File Explorer. We're gonna have that one enabled. And we're gonna go down to Settings, and we're gonna have that enabled as well. But as you can see, there's tons of different settings that you can do inside of the settings. You can go through your, your TCIP, your system, your Windows Defender, your update, or Windows Update. You know, I would highly recommend leaving Windows Update turned on, but if you don't want it, here you go. You can always disable Windows Update right here, but it would be very stupid to do that. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna leave that one on default. So the next one we're gonna go into is services. And if you click on here, these are all of the default settings for services. So whether it be manual or automatic or disabled, this is the way that a default version of Windows sets up all of their services. And as you can see, essentially everything is here. So if there's certain ser services, like for instance, Windows search that you don't wanna be on automatic, you can always go here and you can disable it right from the get go. However, on these ones right here, I'm gonna leave this one on automatic, but you can change anything you want inside of here. And if you go down into extra services, it's essentially the same thing. These here are essentially known services like the Apple ID driver and things of that nature. These may not be a full list, but it's a pretty good list. So you can scroll through here and if there's a certain service that always enables itself for different for different devices or different applications, you can always come in here and disable it ahead of time so it's not enabled in your custom copy of Windows. So now the next step that we're gonna go into is right here where it says unattended. Now in unattended, this is essentially what helps you to change some of the aspects of Windows setup. So whether or not you want a user account to be created automatically, um, this is way you can disable Microsoft accounts from within the setup, which is really handy <laughs> or other different features of the Windows setup that you want to do that normally you would put in an unattended file. Well, this helps you to create the unattended file in a GUI. So let me walk you through this and we'll set up a file for our ISO. Okay, so if you wanna change the default unattended file, what you're gonna to have to do is come up to the top right here and hit enabled. Now, as soon as you hit enabled, it's essentially going to go by your settings instead of the default Windows ones. And some of the changes that I'm gonna make here is mainly gonna be in the OOBE final install options and stuff like that. But some of the things that you wanna do, like for instance, you can come up here and you can hit add local account. And if you do that, this essentially will create a local account just from the ISO that you don't have to create during the setup process. I'm gonna click right here. So what we can do is go through, we're gonna auto log in this user. Be really careful about enabling the built-in administrator account using this account, because essentially what it's gonna do is make the account the built-in administrator account. And that, that might actually have some, some side effects that I wouldn't recommend. But you can change your group right here from custom users or administrators. So you can create an administrator account. And then for the name on this one, I'm just gonna name this one me, Rich. And for password, enter whatever password you want. And then display name, same thing. You can have whatever display name that you want. And then confirm the password if you entered a password and you can enter a description as well. And then once you fill all this out to the way you like, go ahead and hit okay and it'll create a user account just like that. And there's lots of other settings that you can change in here. If you scroll through here and you look at some of these settings, some of these are actually really, really helpful. You can skip the Windows welcome message. You can skip the EUL page completely. In fact, that one right there might be a good one to skip. You can skip the online Microsoft account creation, which that one we're definitely gonna do. We can skip wireless setup. We can skip network location and we can actually tell it what the network location is going to be. So if it's gonna be a home setup for Pro, then you can have it automatically set or you can do a work setup. Or if you want, you can have it just default and have you choose the network location. You can also skip go, get going fast. You can skip the Windows welcome screen. And as you, as you can see, if you go through here, there's lots of different things that you can change. You can even change the OEM information. If you come here, you can change the manufacturer, the logo, things of that nature. If you have a business where you do a lot of the OEM information, you can change all that right here and then it'll be part of the Windows install. And you don't have to do this later on. And as you, as you scroll through here, there's lots of different settings that you can change. I'm gonna go ahead and leave most of these up to you guys to go ahead and look through and see which ones you wanna change. But 
You can even create the computer name right from here. However, if you're using this ISO to set up a lot of systems, I don't know that I would recommend setting up the computer name. That, that might cause a problem in the future when all of your computers have the same network name. But if you go through here, there's lots of different settings that you can change, but I'm not gonna do a lot of these things. I'm essentially gonna keep it mostly default. Some of the things that I did wanna change though was definitely the Microsoft account one. And then at this point, we're gonna go into post setup. Now post setup, this is the one that many of you guys have probably been waiting for because I know the most common question that I got during the video on the MSDN toolkit is how can I put regular apps in to the Windows install? And unfortunately, you simply couldn't. However, now you can. Let me show you how to do it. Okay, so this portion is a little bit more complicated. So this one you're gonna have to pay attention on and it's gonna be different depending on what applications you're using. But for me, I'm gonna install three applications. I'm gonna show you how to install Chrome, Firefox, and VLC. And you know, to be honest with you, the only reason I'm putting Firefox in this video is because people keep criticizing me for only using Chrome. But you know what? You use whatever browser you want. I'll show you how to install Firefox anyway though because, you know, why not? So the first one we're gonna do is Chrome. Now, what you need is you, you can't just have the regular setup file that downloads the application when you install it. And I'm not sure, it's essentially what you're looking for is a bundle where the entire application comes in the EXE. Now, normally that's with an MSI. However, some EXEs do it as well. But in this case, with Chrome, it's gonna be the Chrome browser, the corporate version or the enterprise version of the Chrome browser, which essentially is the same thing. It just comes bundled in the entire higher executable in there. So what we're gonna do is click on bundle for 64 bit. We're gonna go ahead and download Chrome right here. And then to set this up, we go ahead and minimize. And then we're gonna go into our downloads folder here. And we're gonna extract Chrome right here just so we can get it out into the executable itself. And it might take a second to extract here. And once it finishes, we will be right there, okay? So from there, we're gonna open up our Chrome Enterprise and then we wanna go into installers and then right here, the Chrome standard, standalone Enterprise 64 is the one that we're looking for. So from there, what we want, we wanna click add, we wanna click file, and then we wanna go into the same folder we were just in, go into installers and select the Chrome standard edition and then hit okay. And there we go. And as you can see, the parameters have automatically been added. And these parameters are extremely important. You need to find a way to install whatever application you're installing in a silent install. There can't be any user prompts. It has to happen completely automated. And if it doesn't, essentially you'll get stuck on the screen with this right here and it'll never finish. And unfortunately, that was the hardest part for me when setting this whole thing up was finding which applications and how to install them passively or silently because there was a lot of just waiting on that screen, wondering if the setup was ever gonna start again. And most of the time it didn't, but I'll show you at least how to get it to work with Chrome, Firefox and VLC for my examples for this video. So let's move on. Okay, so we got Chrome set up. The parameter for Chrome is simply forward slash passive. So the next one that we're gonna do is our VLC. And I'll keep a link in the description below where you can download these installers that I'm showing you right now. But we're gonna scroll down, we're gonna get the latest version of VLC right here. And then once we get to it, we wanna make sure that we get the Windows 64. So I'm gonna download the EXE in this case, but you can either download the EXE or the MSI. So we're gonna download the EXE here. And then once it downloads, it's gonna take a second it's about 40 megs, so it takes a second. So it should be done by now. So we're gonna click on Firefox now, and we're gonna select Firefox. Then we're gonna select Windows 64, English USA, and then download now. And it'll go ahead and download the executable for Firefox. And like I said before, this has to be the full on download. It can't be a lighter download, like kind of how you would typically install Chrome, that won't work. It has to be the entire program. And you also need to know what the switches themselves are, which I'm gonna show you right now, at least for these programs. So we're gonna click on add, file, and then the next one we want is going to be VLC. We're gonna open that one. And as you can see, this one did not automatically give us the parameter we need, and we do need that parameter. So what for VLC, I've already done the research. The parameter is forward slash capital S, and that will give us a silent install. And then we're gonna go ahead and add file again, and we're gonna pick Firefox this time. We're gonna open it up. And for Firefox, it's the same thing, forward slash 
capital S for silent. Now, whatever program you decide you wanna install with your Windows setup, you're gonna to have to go and do the research in order to find out how you can get a silent install to function because it does have to be silent for each application. Now, you can use a program like Enite in order to download all the programs at once. Unfortunately, Enite will not work with a silent install unless you pay for the pro version. And for this, I don't think it's worth it, but you do what you wanna do. Let's move on to the next step. Okay, so these are all the apps that I'm gonna install here just for reference, but you can kind of get the idea. You can essentially choose as many apps as you want as long as they have a way to silently install them. So now the next one, we're gonna go down to apply, and then here's where we actually get to make our ISO. So for this, we wanna save the image. We want standard editable WIM. If you want, you can go to the high compression ESD, but it's gonna take a long time for it to compress it, so, I wouldn't do that. I would just do the WIM. Unless you're tight on space and you're actually trying to burn this to a DVD drive, but most people are gonna be using thumb drives and a WIM will work just fine. But you do wanna create an ISO. So we're gonna check create ISO and it's gonna ask us where we wanna create it. So we're just gonna take this one and throw it right here on the desktop and I'll just leave it named NT Lite. Then we can hit save and then it'll ask us what we want the label on our ISO to be and NT Lite is fine. And we're gonna go ahead and hit okay. Okay, so the final step before we create our ISO is just to push this green button here that says process. Once we push that, it's gonna tell us that Windows Defender was detected. Now, unfortunately, Windows Defender is gonna have some false positives while using this program. So essentially, if you hit yes, they'll go ahead and open Windows Defender for you. You click on here, you click manage settings, and right here where it says real-time protection, just turn that off and hit yes. And then Windows Defender is really good about turning that on automatically again later, so you shouldn't have to worry about it, but you might wanna check it just to make sure. So I'm gonna close this, we're gonna hit yes, and it'll go through the process of creating the ISO for us. Now, this step is going to take a really long time, especially depending on what kind of choices you made and how fast your computer is. However, it also, this is another limitation of the free version of NT Lite. As you can see, it just gave me a prompt. Let me show you what it is. Okay, so as you can see right here, this message is non-existent when fully licensed. Action is instead fully automated. Essentially, these prompts right here, this is a really annoying feature, but this program, if you don't pay for the licensed version and you use the free one, it's gonna constantly nag you and stop the program while it's creating the ISO, and you're just gonna have to keep hitting okay all the time. Unfortunately, depending on how many steps you have to go through, you might have to click that several times. So unfortunately, you just have to deal with the prompts. You get what you pay for. If you don't want the prompts to be there, you can pay for the licensed version and you won't have to deal with them. However, <laughs> there's another one there. It's not a good idea if you're using the free version to walk away from your computer while this is happening because once these prompts come up, the program stops. It doesn't move on to the next step. So you're gonna have to hit okay in order to move on to the next step. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this thing finish and then we'll continue on with the video. But don't stop now just because we have the ISO because there's a couple other steps you have to make and I'm gonna show you how to test this ISO before you do it on a bare metal system because you know, it's really easy to mess an ISO up with this program. So let me show you how to test it and we'll move on to that once this finishes up. Okay, once you're finished, you'll get this window right here that says it's completed and all you have to do is hit okay. And at this point, we can go ahead and close NT Lite. So when you close it, it'll wanna clean up the image and it's gonna clean up the cache essentially. So it's gonna take a minute to clean this up. So we're gonna open up our browser and the program I want you to download is called VirtualBox. This is essentially just a way so you can run virtual machines from within Windows. And you can do this with a lot of different programs, but this is the one that I like to do. So just go ahead and click on downloads, pick the one for your operating system. If it's gonna be for Windows, you're gonna click Windows. And then I would also recommend download Loading the extension pack right here too, but that's not really important right now. We just wanna to test to see if this is actually gonna work. So to do that, we're gonna open up VirtualBox right here. And as you can see, I've already got one set up here. This is the one that I was using for testing while I was writing this video in the first place. So what you wanna do is you wanna click on new, and then from new, you wanna create a new virtual machine. So this one, I'm just gonna call it Windows 11. And then from here, we're gonna select the ISO image. If yours isn't on the list, you can just go ahead and hit other. Go over to your desktop or wherever you st stored your ISO. Click on NT Lite and click open. And then from here, I'm gonna go skip unattended installations. And then from there, 
We click on next. And then here you want to kind of maybe give it a little bit more hardware than four gigs of RAM and two cores. So I'm going to go ahead and give mine eight gigs of RAM and I'm going to give it four cores right here. But you're going to be limited to what hardware you have on your system with how much you're going to be able to give it right here. So we're going to go ahead and click next. And then for disk size, 80 gigs is fine. We're just testing it so it doesn't really matter. So we're going to go ahead and hit next. And at this point we hit finish and this will create our Windows 11 virtual machine. And from that point, all you got to do is hit start and then it'll go ahead and start the virtual machine and it'll get started with the setup process. And from there, all you have to do is once you see this screen, press any key to boot from CD and it'll go through the process and it'll install Windows 11. However, this process is gonna take a minute, so I'm gonna go ahead and run through the setup process and I'll meet you when Windows 11 is finished installing. Okay, so here we are, we're booting into Windows 11. And as you can see here, we have everything set up the way we wanted. We have the light background with the dark already set up. We have all of our programs pre-installed. This is Firefox, Chrome, and VLC Media Player. And essentially, no bloatware at all. This is actually a pretty clean version of Windows 11. Okay, so once Windows 11 is functioning right inside of a virtual machine, you can go ahead and install it on bare metal at this point or on a regular system. The reason why we installed it in a virtual machine was just to make sure that everything was functioning the way it was supposed to, making sure the applications installed like they were supposed to, and making sure there wasn't any surprises that we would find out when we installed it on a regular system. So by doing it in a virtual box first, we can troubleshoot all the problems that we may have. And when I was originally doing this, I actually did have to set it up several times in order to get a working copy of Windows. So there are a lot of settings that you can change that can break the install. So just keep that in mind when you're setting yours up. So with this program, you should be able to make a version of Windows 11 that fits your needs specifically. In fact, I've done a lot of videos on debloating Windows, but for me personally, I don't run a debloated copy of Windows on my own systems and I don't install them on customer systems. And this is because there are a lot of downsides to running a debloated copy of Windows. Unfortunately, there's a lot of programs that expect the bloat to be there, and when it's not, some programs simply won't work. I've seen issues in the past with games that won't play cutscenes because of a missing Windows Media Player, and the NVIDIA Control Panel won't install unless Windows Store is installed. That's just a few examples. There are many, many more. So, for this reason, I don't personally run debloated copies of Windows, and I definitely don't put them on my customer systems, because personally, I don't want to give free tech support when something doesn't work the way it's supposed to on a computer that I worked on. However, I do make a lot of changes after Windows is installed, and I can pretty much guarantee you that I'm going to make a custom ISO with those settings integrated into an ISO moving forward, because that's gonna save me a huge amount of time. In fact, I'm gonna have to do some experimentation on how much customization you can integrate into an ISO. In fact, the possibilities are endless with the ability to integrate registry tweaks into the ISO itself. If you'd like to see a few examples of some registry entries that I would include in my own ISO, then check out this video where I show you some really cool registry tweaks for Windows 11. There's also a part two to that video as well. As always, you guys have a great day.